welcome to this house of worship. Welcome to this house of prayer. Welcome to this house of peace and kingship. In the midst of this gathering of hope and celebration, we welcome your deepest sorrow and your most exalted joy, your most mundane worry, and your most frantic fear. To rest for this hour in good company, to find healing on the altar of love and hope in the sacred spirit present among us. Welcome to worship this hour. If you think your baby or toddler would be comfortable in the nursery, locate the link 
We have gentle and kind, safe, sir, certified caregivers while you're in the service. We're making new strides in the process of welcoming and greeting both longtime members and newcomers here at First Parish. We will take a moment to do that now using our influenza season greeting. <laughs> Is it? And of course, any 
And all of our human endeavors are like this, aren't they? A conversation. Conversation between an ideal on one side and the reality that we must live with on the other. A conversation between the world as it is and the world we wish for. A call and a response. Today we're going to reflect on callings. How we understand them and how we live them. We choose each week to worship together, believing that dangerous journeys are best done with companions. And each week we light our chalice as a symbolic guide on this journey, a reminder that in the quest for truth, the commitment of our collective light is necessary to illuminate the darkness within which we move. I now invite Veronica and Christopher to come live the chat.
reading this morning is from the Episcopal <coughs> priest Barbara Brown Taylor, who wrote the book Leaving Church as she retired from parish ministry. These words appropriate as for one reflecting back on a career in parish ministry, I think are equally apt for those at any stage of the calling. I would prefer a more user-friendly word like pastor, but the truth is that an ancient word like priest captures the risk of this vocation as well as any I know. In my lexicon, at least, a priest is someone willing to stand between a god and a people who are longing for one another's love, turning back and forth between them with no hope of tending either as well as each deserves. To be a priest is to serve a God who never stops calling people to do more justice and love more mercy, and simultaneously to serve people who, nine times out of ten, are just looking for a safe place to rest. To be a priest is to know that things are not as they should be, and yet to care for them the way they are. To be a priest is to suspect that there is always something more urgent that you should be doing, no matter what you are doing, and to make peace with the fact that the work will never be done. <coughs> to be a priest is to wonder sometimes if you are missing the boat altogether, by deferring pleasure in what God has made until you've fixed it up so it will please God more. When I wake up in the morning, E.B. White once wrote, I can't decide whether to enjoy the world or improve the world. This makes it difficult to plan the day. <laughs> Here it is. I don't want to be a minister. <laughs> At least that is what I was always telling the people around me. Although I have been in denial about my calling to ministry for many years, I have to admit to you that the signs were there early on. As a six-year-old child, I used to wake up very early Sunday morning, make sure my parents were asleep, and sneak downstairs to watch Jerry Falwell on television. <laughs> You see, when you're the son of a Methodist turned atheist and a Jewish agnostic, you have to find creative ways to rebel. <laughs> and my particular advice, uh, my particular advice was uh, televangelism. <laughs> I was enthralled by the music, by the cadence of worship by the thermometer that would go up with every donation. <laughs> In high school, I took a class on career exploration that involved taking an elaborate survey of my likes and dislikes, my strengths and my weaknesses, and it would spit out your ideal career. Mindset minister. <laughs> Followed a great distance down the line by a farmer and large animal vet. <laughs> Perhaps the survey was skewed by a certain Midwestern <laughs> tendency. <laughs> but there was on paper, proven scientifically, that I was to be a minister. A few years later, when I was applying for college, they asked me to write down what career you see yourself going into. And I wrote medical ethicist. Okay, first of all, what 17-year-old decides that he wants to be a medical ethicist when he grows up? Does that every parent scream? <laughs> I hope someday my son will grow up to discern the spiritual and ethical consequences of medical decisions. There it was. I felt the calling in earnest when I was 24. I was walking on one of those beautiful spring mornings on my way to work. And I felt with a deep sense of sudden certainty 
in every cell and every fiber of my body that I should be a minister. The feeling wasn't ecstasy, it wasn't joy. There were no loud lightning bolts, no terrors with trumpets. Rather, it was being filled for the first time in my life with a profound sense of purpose, of certainty. And so what did I do? I brushed to the side and went on to work. As many of you know, for many years I have run a nonprofit that tackles the complex issues of youth violence. And a few years ago I lost one of my students. Dion was a beautiful 17-year-old. He loved art. His smile lit up the room. And he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And was shocked because a bunch of boys thought he was somebody else walking home from the subway. And I remember sitting with his older sister who had been raising him and feeling like I had nothing to offer her. <laughs> that all of my training, all of my education, my ability to read budgets and to manage people, to do staffing charts, to write funding proposals, were useless in that moment. I had been trained to fix problems. And I realized in that moment that you can't fix a dead 17-year-old. You bear witness to it. And there it was again, this call. But I still demurred, saying I wasn't ready, it wasn't time, I had other things that I needed to do. <laughs> Ministry is for wise people. Older people, people who have lived lives worth telling. Two years later, when I was accepted into Divinity School, I thought, that's nice, but there's no way that my family can afford it. Then when my scholarship came through, I thought, well, that's really nice, but there's no way I can make this work logistically. Right, with two kids, another on the way, my wife and I both needing to work to feed and clothe and house those children. There's no way that this could work. Then I went to meet with the registrar. And when we came up with a creative system where I could finish my degree on time, I thought, well, that's great, but do I really want to do this? I was speaking with a minister friend of mine as I was making this decision, and her comment was, come on now, what does God need to do? Drag you to class? <laughs> Write a few papers for you? <laughs> Pick up your dry cleaning? <laughs> but our minds are like that, aren't they? The universe calls to us. It sets up the possibility for so much joy and so much purpose. But we seem to find reasons to say, oh, no thank you, I'm just fine the way that I am. We're offered so many riches in our lives. Love and sparkling sunsets, Sam Cooke music, butter popcorn, amazing jobs and friends. But still it's not enough. We want life to play the record for us. We want God to make the branches just a little bit lower so the tree's easier to climb. We expect the universe to videotape the beauties of nature so that we can watch it later, when we're less busy, when work's easier, when the kids have gone to college. We don't want to hear our calling because we don't want to do the work that that calling demands of us. It takes a great deal of effort and work to change. And that is because becoming someone different, becoming something different involves loss. It involves giving up our comfortable, comfortable ways of knowing, of being known. It means letting go of the familiar. 
We don't respond because it means being uncomfortable, of taking risks. In the Hebrew Bible, when God calls Jonah to bear witness against the city of Nineveh, he resists, he runs away, he survives a tempest at sea, and it's only after spending three days in the belly of a fish does he relent and say, okay, I hear you. I hear you. I know what I need to do. And so I continue to resist. When my friends and colleagues would ask me, well, why are you going to divinity school? And by the way, I always called it divinity school, never seminary. Divinity school, I explained that I wanted to deepen my management toolbox. I wanted to become a stronger leader to speak prophetically about issues that were important to me. I wanted to be a better father. After 15 years of running a nonprofit, I wanted to stop and reflect. But no, I wasn't going to be a minister. What did God need to do? Drive me to class. And there I was sitting in class my first month of school. And we were doing a case study. And it was a case study about a UCC minister who wanted to a fundraiser to cover a shortfall in the budget. And one of the prisoners offered to do a magic show. And in this case study, the prisoner stood up and instead of doing a magic show, told inappropriate jokes. Hopefully that doesn't sound familiar to you. <laughs> And so the professor wrote on the board and said, what are the organizational issues at play here? And I sat in my room and I know that. I run a nonprofit. I know what organizational issues are when you're dealing with people in conflict. And then she asked, what are the pastoral needs here? How do you take care of the people? And I said, I know that. That's what I do every day. I manage a staff, I'm raising kids, I got that down. And then she asked, what are the theological needs? What is God asking of you in this moment? We are all called, each and every one of us, every single day. Each day beckons us to do something, to be something, to live something different. But the question is, what? And that is what we spend our lives figuring out. And we do often get it wrong, don't we? The wrong relationship, the wrong job, the wrong house, the wrong friends, the wrong haircuts. And for those of us who spent any time in the 80s, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Perms. <laughs> and this fear of getting it wrong is paralyzing. Right? It's paralyzing. When I was a chaplain and I would enter a hospital room to see a patient, or every time I stepped into this pulpit, and open my, open my mouth to speak. Every time one of my children was born and this new life was handed to me, I would ask, but what if I'm not enough? What if I, I don't know the right words? What if I don't know the right thing to do? Where's my manual? What if I cannot do what is asked of me? What if I disappoint? What if I misunderstand the message? What if God is calling the wrong person? Sorry, wrong woman. <coughs> this past September, after months of studying, after writing 20 essays, I finally arrived in front of the Ministerial Fellowship Committee of the Unitarian Universalist Association. This was the moment of judgment where I would be told whether or not I was worthy to be 
be called a minister, to be welcomed into fellowship. It's amazing how years of work and struggle and reading and writing get boiled down into 60 minutes in front of a group of 12 people. As I sat there breathing deeply before I was called, an image came to my mind. I imagined all of the people who had helped me get to this place. My family, my friends, the people of this congregation, my internship committee, Parisa, and other ministers and mentors. I had this image of all of these people joining together and holding hands, of encircling me in a ring of love, of confidence, of faith. And I walked into that interview room with a sense of confidence of being held, of being surrounded by a tremendous amount of love and of care. And that is the thing about callings. We are never called alone. We are never called alone. And that is the part of the story of great women and great men that often gets left out. It wasn't just Dr. King who was called to work for justice. It was the thousands and thousands of women and men who sat in church pews and sat around kitchen tables and agreed to not ride the bus and to open their hearts and their pocketbooks and their wallets. Our callings come collectively. <coughs> what is so powerful about our denomination? What is so powerful about Unitarian Universalism as an idea is that it rests its ecclesiastic authority, its power, its ownership among you all, among the congregation. You see, the Ministerial Fellowship Committee cannot ordain you. Only you can. We are all called together to build a spiritual community. There is no pope, there is no bishop, there is no dogma, no confession of faith. We are all called into ministry, each of us, every single one of us together. The ministry of this church is ancient and it is deep and it rests in these pews and not here in this pulpit. We are called together. I had a dream the other night. And in my dream, it was time to start the service. And I couldn't find my road. Anyway. Emma Jean had started playing the prelude. And I was frantic. I looked everywhere. I looked at my car, in the closets, behind doors. Nothing. The prayer room had finished. I peered through the church door, and it was a packed house. And they were waiting. Then I realized that the congregation wouldn't care if I was wearing a robe or not. They didn't come here to see me dressed in black. They were coming to hear me speak. Besides, I was wearing a suit, certainly respectable. So the room was clearly getting anxious, so I walked in. And although my lack of formal attire seemed to momentarily distress some members of the congregation, they soon relaxed into smiles as they saw me enter. I walked up to the pulpit, smiled at the congregation, they smiled back, and I said, good morning. There was a smattering of good mornings in return, and head nods. And then I realized that I had written a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single word. 
So I stood, frozen, looking out at that sea of expectation, looking out at the hopeful, encouraging faces that were quickly growing into discomfort. The discomfort grew as people began to whisper and shift in their pews. Someone said loudly, but what do you expect? He's just an intern. <laughs>
Betty Crocker cookbook, page 67, glossy picture of the triple layers. I realized my cake looked nothing like <laughs> page 67 in the Betty Crocker cookbook. You see, being new to baking, I didn't realize that different sizes of cakes need different amounts of baking time. So the hard, slightly burnt top layer sank into the gooey, undercooked bottom layer. And in my excitement to put frosting on my cake, I had realized that you're supposed to let your cakes cool. <laughs> and so all of that chocolate frosting had congealed and cooled into a pile of chocolate goo at the bottom of my cake. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, that was and is the best cake <laughs> that I have ever eaten. Because it was mine. Because I made it with my own two hands. <laughs> and this congregation is like that cake. It will not be beautiful. Parts of it will be burnt out and crispy. <laughs> And some of it will be gooey and undercooked. <laughs> but it is yours. The ministry of this church does not belong to me. does not belong to Parisa. It is in your hands. May it be a gift to you and to the world. Today is my last Sunday with you. I realize that my time here is only a small part-time blip on a 350-year history. But still, it's my blip. <laughs> and I will miss you terribly. I want to thank you. I want to thank this congregation for the opportunity to explore, to struggle, to fail and hopefully to succeed. To hear God in ways that I never imagined, and to witness and to be challenged by your lives. There's something mystical and mythical about first loves. They get etched in the imagination, a foundation that can last a lifetime. You all have been my first love. While there will be other congregations, other churches, <coughs> other people to catch my eye, they will never occupy the special real estate that you all will in my heart. And ministry is ultimately about love. It has been such a privilege to stand up before you each week and to reflect back that love that radiates from each of you. It is a healthy community that knows how to say goodbye. For they realize that love cannot be bounded or marked by time or space, but it gets carried out into the world by those who have experienced it. And I have experienced that deeply by each and every one of you. It has been such a blessing to be cared for and nurtured by you. And I go forth committed to being an extension of this love, of this community. I'm not sure what path or what road my ministry takes me on. But I can say that risks never seem so great when you have been loved. So I thank you. Thank you for helping me after three decades of avoiding it, of putting the call on hold, of saying, you got the wrong number, God. Thank you for helping me to say yes.
Thank you for helping me to find my purpose, for helping me understand what it means to be a minister. For that, there are simply no words able to express my gratitude. So I leave you with, Amen.
Let us create space in our hearts for Paul as he continues to struggle. And for everyone's part of our community and beyond as he struggles today. Let us lift up our joy. The joy present in each human life and each day. We lift up our joys and our sadness. We lift them up to the God that is mystery. The God who appears in the perfect sunset. The God that God has said would appear to hungry people only in the form of bread. The God that we call love. God, the great mystery that we are unable to name. I invite you to feel the presence of that love as we drift into silence. Staff of this 
church, beginning with Carissa, who offer just amazing spiritual leadership and guidance. They keep this place well run and safe and clean and welcoming. I think we probably have the best staff in the UDA. <laughs> And they are, they represent 75 to 80 percent of the budget. And I think, well, really, that's why I support First Parish because we just have the most gifted and wonderful people here. But then I think about the community, it's the community of people, and how can I not talk about them? That everybody who's uh, country danced with and celebrated sports and political victories with people who I have shared stories with, people who have held my loss of my parents and my anxiety over work. And I think that it's the community, is, as Eric said this morning, is the glue that holds this place together. The people who are here in the pews and without First Parish for us all to come together in this journey, we'd be lost. And so I think that that's my reason for giving. But then I trip over another reason. When Eric asked if I would speak this morning, he sent me a little cheat sheet of questions that I might consider before I spoke. And I actually never made it past the first question. <laughs> Sorry about that, <laughs> I'm sure they were well thought out, out questions. And the question asked, what informs your philosophy of giving? And as I thought about that, I realized it's this church that informs my philosophy of giving. Day in and day out, First Parish reminds me of the values that I wish to live by. Without being dogmatic, the hymns, the music, the sermons, the education, the committee work, they remind me of how and why and where I fit into this great big world. For me, personally, I'm not saying that this is true of anybody else, but certainly for me, it would be so natural, so easy, so very automatic to be complacent and yes, selfish. For me, I'm afraid that's my default position. I'm hardwired to take care of me and my own first, as I think we all are. But then I come here, I read the link, or I speak with somebody from church about a particular program, and once again, I'm reminded of who it is that I really wish to be. First Parish demands that I live fully in the greater world and in the greater community. It asks it of me all the time. And because of that, I find that I am more willing to support other causes in actions, in words, as well as financially when I can. Whether it's a microfinance program like Finco or Planned Parenthood, whether it's the Cancer Society or the Police Association, whether it's a program at the public schools or creative arts for at-risk youth. It's because of who I'm asked to be as a member of this community that I find myself thinking beyond to these other programs. First Parish asks me to be in touch with my better self over and over again, because if I do that, I end up being a better parent, a better friend, and a better neighbor. We all need reminding sometimes of the path that we wish to follow in life. Uh, it's part of what makes organized religion it's so critical to everybody. Uh, Muslims pray five times a day to Mecca. Well, it's not just to say, hi God, how you doing? <laughs> it's to remind them of where they need to be in this world. Why Catholics say the rosary. Why we continue to go on this journey together that we do. And so, although I'm a member of First Parish for a whole variety of reasons, and they're all important, supporting this institution is critical because it supports and reinforces my values. It forms my foundation. This offering will now be gratefully and humbly received.
Studying about men who know the way and who shall wear the robe and crown. Good Lord, show me the way.
call. We call to welcome the stranger, to care for the sick, to free the prisoners, to work for peace within your hearts, within the walls of this congregation, and within the world. May it be so.
Chris Packett was on the committee for the first half of our job. Um, we've been working with Eric for the last year and a half since he came here. And our goal has been to be a supportive group for Eric to use his sound sounding board and to provide feedback for him. You guys can sit down one um, <laughs> um, We have also assisted him in the process of completing his internship by um, completing his evaluations and have helped him to find his learning plan while here. Eric applied for his internship with us in the summer of um, 2008. He interviewed with our committee and Parisa, and we all concluded that we were a good match to go forward together. Uh, he has worked with us for one and a half years, part time, and has completed all of the requirements of the internship. He has gotten actually way above and beyond the requirements and has accomplished much well, well with us. While here, he has developed uh, meaningful connections with many of us. He has provided us with many thought-provoking sermons, and we have learned to expect both insight, challenges, and humor from him. He also assisted in conducting a Seder in one for Adam Parisa at General Assembly to provide programming there. He coordinated summer services, speaking at several of them himself. He has been a patient and a presence for many of us, and has a gift for listening and connecting with people. He has spearheaded our small group ministry program. Embracing a special opportunity, he provided leadership and continuity for us during the brief opportunity. <clears throat> In October, he went before the Ministerial Fellowship Committee of the UUA and passed his interview with the highest possible score. We as a committee have had the privilege and pleasure of watching his growth over the past 18 months. We will miss him very much, as we know you will also. We know he will do well wherever he goes, and he has left us in a much better place for his having been here. It will certainly be difficult for any subsequent interns to meet our expectations from here on <laughs> He has done all of this while working full time, going to school, and being a husband and father of three. We thank him for sharing himself with us during this time. He has become an important member of our community, and we will feel his absence. Now, at the conclusion of Eric's internship, we hope he will vote with us to recommend Eric to become ordained as a union minister. Mary's made a motion for what Dane Eric Dawson as a UU Ministry Director of Second. <laughs> motion duly made and seconded, but I don't hear any further discussion. I think a, a voice vote would be in order here. All in favor of what Dane Eric Dawson, please say aye. Aye.
we want to invite you all to the social gathering for the luncheon, which will happen in just a few minutes. Um, so we want to honor Eric for the work that he has done here, and we want to celebrate his organization. Um, when I say honor him and his work, I think we all have superlatives that uh, come to mind. Um, Mary mentioned some of them, extraordinary, above and beyond, powerful, important. Um, and I want to thank you deeply for, for all you've done here. And I want to thank you in particular for a brilliant sermon that you did on covenant and the way you covenant and the parish committee was grateful for your help in, in uh, doing the work that we had set out for ourselves this year. Um, so we're delighted at your success and uh, sad to see you leave. Um, I have a, a plaque that I want to present to you, um, which is made from the wood from our pews, which you may recognize. Um, I'll just read to you what it says. In appreciation of your ministry, leadership, and friendship. And then there is a quotation here by a man named Nelson Henderson. And it says, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. And I think that's really appropriate for uh, the work that Eric has done here. For example, in small group ministries, it is a, um, a field he has planted. Uh, we're already beginning to see the flourishing of the field and the, the setting of the buds. And I know that we will have uh, years and generations of, of fruit of, of those trees that you've planted. So I'd say thank you. And, uh, and uh, we have a small gift for you as well. We have to the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
don't teach gift opening in seminary. <laughs>
we send forth Eric, a faithful servant of the Spirit, an ambassador of God's love, to carry forth the lessons learned from and with this community into a ministry rich, with compassion, devoted to justice, and alive with hope for our world and our faith. This we do in the name of every sacred spirit we know and those that remain in the spirit of us. This we do in the name of God, of the God of life, the God of love, 